Hello, everybody. Welcome to this event. I'm so glad you're able to come here for a special guest speaker. Uh, this event is co-sponsored by the UDM Domestic Violence Committee, as well as CLASA. CLASA stands for the Kearney Latin American Solidarity Archive. I'm Dr. Gail Presby. I direct that archive, which is devoted to peace and justice issues, focusing on Latin America, but also addressing uh, wider topics having to do with peace and justice. So we are very happy to be uh, collaborating together on this event, and so glad that you are able to uh, come. Uh, also this evening, we have uh, Dr. Irene Leeds from the English department. She and her students have devised an IRB-approved survey on domestic violence. So she is going to be uh, passing that around to you. She would like to get uh, some of your feedback on that. And also, we have information from La Vida Domestic Violence Center which you are welcome to help yourself to if you uh, would like to find out more about the work they do in helping people by all means. Uh, at the end, you might want to come down there and get some of their literature as well. Uh, so now let me tell you a little bit about our special guest speaker, uh, Dr. Laura Finley. Uh, she and I uh, met through the Peace and Justice Studies Association, uh, educators who come together and talk about how they address peace and justice issues in the classroom with their students. She is uh, an associate professor of sociology and criminology at Barry University in Florida. She's the author of several books and articles and she is very active in so many community organizations and with students on a range of issues, including the environment and other uh, uh, peace and justice issues. But this issue of domestic violence is very dear to her, and so we are happy to hear her presentation on preventing domestic violence. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Finley. Thank you so much, everyone. I think can probably hear me without a microphone because I tend to have a very loud voice. Uh, but let me know if for some reason we can't. Um, thank you to Dr. Presby for inviting me and to the other groups that co-sponsored the events. I'm really happy to be here. I'm actually a native Michigander, but I haven't been back in the state a lot in the last few years since I've lived in Florida, and so it's a nice change of pace. It's a little cooler, um, which is kind of nice because we're still pretty hot. Um, so as I proposed be said, I, I teach sociology and criminology, and so I teach a lot about these subjects because of course they come up in our course content. However, I also have a lot of experience for the last eight years working in the field of domestic violence. I worked at a formal shelter for a while. My job wasn't working so much directly with victims, although I did a little bit of working with victims. I did mostly education. I'm, I'm, an, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator. So I had the position of going to the community and doing much like we're doing today, trying to raise awareness so that eventually we can help prevent abuse in any home. Um, obviously that's a huge task, and obviously we're not there yet, but uh, I've done a lot of this kind of thing. I'm super excited that we have an eclectic crowd here today, including students um, studying in the medical fields, which I've also presented about a lot as well, um, because oftentimes the medical professionals are the front line, they're the first people who identify or are told about abuse happening, and you're in such an ideal position then to help somebody get out, to get safe, to get the help that they need. And so it's fantastic to see those folks here, um, and I'm glad we have so many others as well. Um, I currently work with another group that's a much more grassroots type organization, and I'm happy to speak to that if that comes up, but um, not where I was going to really focus today. You are probably, however, wondering why on earth I'm dressed in a bridal gown. So I should probably commence with that piece of the study. So I dress in this gown when I speak about this often, this big bridal gown, um, in honor of this woman you see here. Her name is Gladys Streetheart, as you can see. And she was murdered by her abusive ex-boyfriend on September 26, 1999 in New Jersey, just minutes after that picture was taken. 
As you can see, Gladys is dressed beautifully. She is ready to be married. It's the day you know, women and men, I think, often dream of. You're going to be with your whole family. She had even had a videographer there. Everyone in her close proximity was around her when her ex-boyfriend, Augustine Garcia, gained access into the home where she was posing for the pictures and being videotaped, and he shot her in the head multiple um, it turns out, as case details were revealed, Augustine Garcia had been abusive to her in a variety of other ways. She had sought a restraining order against him. She finally had left him and fairly quickly had fallen in love with this other man that she was set to be wed. Um, that's tragic. I mean, I hope we all agree that it's tragic. Bride shot dead on her wedding day is not anything we should read about in the news. Another layer of the tragedy, however, is that, of course, media picked up on this case. And it makes sense they would. We hope they do report logically on crimes. And this one has that one that leads it leads kind of titillation factor, right? Because here she is in her gown looking gorgeous and she got shot. Um, there actually is a video tape of it, although you don't see the actual homicide, but you hear the shots, you hear it's kind of see the chaos around it. Unfortunately, again, that layer of tragedy that so often happens was when the media got a hold of the case, they started to do what often happens, and that is somehow blame the victim. So some of the coverage was of the nature, well, what could she have done to provoke him? What could she possibly have been cheating on him during their relationship? And that's why he was so outraged that he came in and shot her point blank in the head. I hope it says my, my, my tone there, because it's, it's clearly outrageous to suggest that a victim brings on her own murder by somebody she has left a relationship with. But this was the nature of a lot of the coverage. And unfortunately, today is the nature of a lot of domestic violence media coverage. So I think her case, among many others, call our attention to correcting a lot of those myths, misconceptions that are out there about domestic violence, about both the victims and the perpetrators, about the dynamics of abusive relationships. And I also want to share with you that out of all the tragedy that was the case of Gladys Ricard, um, some interesting movements have emerged. And I'm part of one, and I'd like to share that with you as a piece of an example of, of a prevention type program. So that's kind of what I wanted to begin with, and we're going to get into that other, um, you know, what, what the movement looks like later. I am going to leave us ample time for questions and discussion, because I feel like probably there will be some. There's this kind of topic there often is, and as many of us know, it's very hot in the media right now due to some high-profile incidents. Not that far different from Black Street Heart's case. It is also October, which is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and so I'm happy that we're able to draw attention to that. I want to show you some pictures first, though. And while I show you these pictures, um, I'm going to tell you more about sort of who are the victims, who are the perpetrators, and what do we know about abuse. First, looking at it from a global lens, the estimates are, as you can see in this visual, and I know it's probably not close enough to see the specific numbers, but the one in three is the piece that probably jumps out, and it should. One in three of the one, one third of the world's women at some point will experience an abusive relationship. That's with, usually with an intimate partner, so it's sometimes called IPV or intimate partner violence, but sometimes that might be with somebody that's not technically an intimate partner. So sometimes the studies couple some different things together, but one in three should be shocking numbers, right? I mean, we have, thankfully, a lot of men in here, but if we took a third of the girls in this room or the ladies in this room and had us all stand up, we'd get that horrible visual. That's a lot of people in this room alone. World studies, much like the one you kind of see depicted here, have shown that in some countries the rates are even higher than that. For instance, the World Health Organization did a study in 2005, and they found in some parts of rural Chile, Ethiopia, and some other countries, 70 to 71% of women had experienced physical abuse. And notice my emphasis on the word physical, because these are some of the issues that are very difficult to tally good numbers on, okay? And some of the reasons will be logical to you, one reason why it's hard to get really realistic, really good numbers on how often domestic violence happens is because we tend to define it as largely a physical phenomenon. But those of us who are in the field, and many of us probably in the room who know somebody who's been in an abusive relationship know, it is not all physical. There's all kinds of other components of an abusive relationship that don't get, excuse me, don't get measured very well. They don't necessarily make those numbers. Right? So these studies tend to focus on physical abuse and not even the full scope or full range of abuse. Another difficulty in getting accurate numbers, of course, is that many times the studies we have come from, I feel, they come from crime data. 
incidents reported to police or law enforcement. I think probably we could very quickly in our brains list a number of reasons why victims don't necessarily report all incidents to police. So the reason I say all this is we're gonna, I'm gonna share with you the best numbers we have, but we have to know that those numbers are probably an underestimate, if anything, of the sheer scope of the problem. And so if you're talking about one third of the world's world, this is something we definitely need to be paying attention to. In fact, at one point, the United Nations uh, Secretary General called gender-based violence the world's worst human rights violation. That's obviously an opinion to some degree, but um, I think suggestive, again, of the scope of the problem. But it is not just a global problem. Obviously, it's a problem in our country as well. Um, and part of the problem is the numbers of people who still believe it's OK to physically abuse your partner. This is just one study that I found. This was a global study. This was not focused on the United States. But it's the percent of women who believe it's OK for their husband to hit them. And again, I don't know if you can clearly read all those numbers, but in some of these countries, we're looking at 3 quarters or more percent of women think it is OK for their husband to hit them. Clearly, we need to change some of these ideas about what is and isn't OK in a relationship. And the numbers are lower in the United States of people who will say, it's OK for my husband to hit me. However, we have, again, some of the same issues. In the United States, the estimates are that one-fourth to one-third of all women will experience abuse, so not dramatically lower than in some of these other countries. And it is one of the most significant causes of death for females. Um, globally, more women are killed by men's violence than are killed by malaria, war, traffic accidents, and car accidents, or traffic accidents combined. All those things. More women are killed by, by men's violence against them. Those are shocking, again, statistics. So I, I, I like to start with the, the kind of the picture, framing it. As you can see in this slide, you know, half the female murder victims, the perpetrator was in, like in Gladys Reedhart's case, a partner, a, a spouse, a former spouse, etc. Um, the estimate is in the United States about 1,300 people are killed every year from domestic violence. Of course, it isn't always deadly. Right? There's all sorts of other ways domestic violence affects not in, only individuals, but families, communities, the entire society. The estimates are that it costs us somewhere around $6 billion a year to deal with domestic violence. By deal with any medical costs, mental health costs, lost work productivity, uh, child care issues, the whole gamut, the uh, legal systems, the whole gamut in which we, victims interact is a costly endeavor, and it does, again, impact all of us. Um, so our, of course, ultimate goal should be to prevent domestic violence, homicides, and tragedies, but that's just one piece, right? We need to back that up and, and again, work on preventing it from happening at all. This is a case that just broke in my home state of Florida. I'm not sure how much media coverage it got down here, but it's getting a lot in Florida. Um, this man, 51-year-old Don Spirit, killed his daughter and six grandchildren. One was an infant in uh, Bell, it's a small town about three hours north of where I live, and um, this was a situation that was probably quite preventable. Um, Bell had been in trouble in the past. He had criminal history. He actually had accidentally, uh, according to the course anyways, killed a, another son a couple of years ago. Um, he was a known drug user. He was on the radar of the Department of Children and Families. They had visited the home. Um, mom was a sorry, not, not mom, the mom of the kids, his daughter, was a known drug user as well. Um, they had been advised, you know, we, DC, DCF had said, maybe we should get these kids out of the home. Oh, wait, no, we shouldn't. And the result was a multiple homicide. To me, these are preventable crimes. If this many people know that something off is in that family, if these many people know there's domestic violence happening in the family, then there's so many touch points in which intervention could have happened to prevent a tragedy like this. And again, I'm going to share with you this, this model that, that I hope will, will be something that's useful. <clears throat> I also wanted to make note that we are not just talking about something that impacts women. Um, a lot of times when we use statistics, we say women, because a lot of the studies have, of course, been done on women. Um, but there is a percentage of men who are victims of domestic violence. Annually, the federal estimates are about 15% of victims are males. Again, we have to take that bit with a grain of salt because I think maybe we can make an argument that's a pretty, pretty good one, that males are even less likely to report than females. So our numbers may be even less accurate when you talk about male victimization. And 
But it's important, I think, to acknowledge that, again, males too are victims. I think for a long, long time, the domestic violence movements have not done a good job of making that, re that recognition, and I feel like it's a really important one. Um, I also think that in my own past, um, sometimes the domestic violence movements have encouraged us to speak about this as if males are would-be perpetrators, women are would-be victims, and that's sort of the way it rolls. And I think that's deeply problematic because most males do not abuse the people that they love, right? There's a small percentage that do. And so talking at the males in the crowd as if you're about to go batter your wife or your girlfriend is not effective and it's alienating. And talking to women as if we're all gonna be a victim is disempowering, I believe, as well. But I think we need an honest conversation about what do the statistics tell us about who is abused and by whom, right? When you talk about dating violence, which I'm gonna mention again more in a minute, the statistics are much more even. It's almost equally likely that a girl will avoid, abuse a boy she's dating as the other way around. So again, I think that behooves us all to pay attention to abuse in any home regardless of who may be doing it or any relationship regardless who may be the perpetrator. I just pulled this particular picture of, to exemplify that idea that males also are victims and also to highlight the point that really anyone can be a victim. As you see here, Isaac's a middle-aged doctor, professional. He's clearly an intelligent guy. Um, he endured emotional, verbal, and physical abuse. His wife tried to stab him. Um, it happened in public, and no one did a thing. Again, another touch point for a lot of people to intervene and do something. But I also want to point out, like I said, that that, that middle-aged doctor piece. These are a lot of misconceptions that only not very smart people are weak enough to get in an abusive relationship. And if you stay with somebody who abuses you, you must not be very bright, you must have some problems, you must be low in self-esteem, you must be mentally ill or something yourself, right? Because I would be smarter, braver, more courageous, you know, not dumb enough to get in that relationship. And I guess that's, to me, a very dangerous logic as well. This is a smart guy. I know a lot of smart victims. People who <laughs> believed in their partner and believed in the love of their partner and were taken advantage of and exploited, that's not their fault. And they shouldn't be the one who's blamed or pointed out their flaws. The focus should be on the person who chose to perpetrate against them. But I, I feel like we have a lot of conversations still in our communities that are very insidiously victim blaming. And so again, I kind of want to raise some, some thoughts on that and maybe people have questions we can come back to on those. You can't have missed this one if you pay any attention to media. Uh, obviously, this is the elevator shot from when Ray Rice punched his then girlfriend, Jane Palmer, now wife, um, in the elevator, knocked her out. Um, again, I hope they didn't miss it so it won't be labeled a point, but I put this slide in to really to recognize that there are some groups that are more um, prone to allegations of abuse. And notice the very careful language there. It is dangerous to go into a group and say, athletes are more likely to abuse their partners. First of all, that's not necessarily accurate. And second, it's dangerous again, because it paints with too wide of a brush. However, there are certain athletic groups that are overrepresented as alleged abusers. Okay? They may be abusing at higher rates. It's possible they're not. It's possible that they are, in some cases, wrongly accused. This was clearly not one of those. But I want to be careful because, uh, again, sometimes I think we put people under attack, you know, when we come out as if, like, the NBA and the NFL, they are full of abusers. Well, that's not actually true either, right? They may have an issue with it, and I definitely think they need to be grappling with it, but I think we need to also recognize that, again, there are cultures in which abuse is more likely. It's not exclusive to the NFL, it's not exclusive to this other group, but it's generally male-dominated cultures in which their very uh, you know, hyper-masculine, aggressive posturing is not only encouraged but rewarded. It is why, again, we may be seeing a scandal in the NFL. We have seen an uh, increased likelihood of military involvement in domestic and sexual violence among certain fraternity groups. Again, that sort of male bonding, misogynistic kind, not all kinds. And so what, do we, what does that tell us about perpetrators? Well, it tells us that maybe there's some feedback they get from peer to peer support that encourages the likelihood of abuse continuing. I think that's important because oftentimes, especially on college campuses, I'm not speaking to yours because I don't know well enough peers, but I will speak to my own, um, 
our interventions or our prevention efforts are focused on don't be a victim, okay? Ladies, protect yourself. Don't be a victim of domestic or sexual assault. A, don't drink. If you do drink, cover your drink. Don't ever take a drink from a guy. Walk in packs, touch the blue light, take rape, aggression, self-defense. This litany of things all directed at me as a would-be victim, right? I have to change my behavior, or ladies, we change our behavior so that we don't get victimized, right? That could be one component of your whole campus approach. But when you focus your approach on target hardening, as it's called in criminology, you're missing the whole other side of how do we change those cultures? How do we change cultures like the NFL or again some of these fraternities or other groups where we know there are risk factors of perpetration, not just risk factors of being a victim, right? And so when we're crafting responses and prevention programs, I think we need to make sure we're paying equal time to not just the would-be victims, but also to what what are what makes you more likely to perpetrate and how do we address those factors? We had an issue on my campus um, just a couple weeks ago where one of our employees was actually trained to speak to students about substance abuse and dating and domestic violence. And her messaging to students was, ladies, if you don't drink, you won't get victimized. Okay. Yeah, I, I have to go to the stick on that. <laughs> um, like, this is not okay. It's not an okay message. Is it good advice to be careful about what you drink and who you're around? Well, okay. But if that is the message in exclusion of any other notification of, well, what do we do about the people who are perpetrating the problem? We're missing a lot. So um, this screen kind of cuts it up a little bit over here. Just as a few things related to the dating violence issue, since I knew it was coming to our campus. You know, a lot of people think of domestic violence, they think of marital couples. We do have some laws across the country related to dating violence, people who are in dating relationships, which is more likely folks that are in our crowd. And, and what you see here suggests that the scope of this problem is pretty big as well. So approximately 20% of young women, they say, will be a victim of sexual assault in college. A recent study says it may be even higher than that. Um, one in 10 teens in a physically abusive relationship. Other studies have put it as high as 30%. So we're talking about this isn't just something that you know, adults need to worry about or in marital relations or formally married relations, but also teens as well. And thinking about what are those warning signs of unhealthy and unhealthy relationships. I also want to go back to the idea of what kinds of abuse happen. Um, when I talk to my students about this, and we say, okay, so what is what, what is the domestic violence or dating violence relationship look like? They still go to that place of black eye, bruise, you know, these kinds of physical signs, the stereotypical signs. But then they all will admit, well, that's not all there is to it, right? And in fact, estimates are that only about 50% of abusive relationships actually are physically abusive. So what might be happening is in the other 50%, the victim gets out before it becomes abusive, physically abusive, right? So maybe it would have gone there if they didn't, didn't go there. Or maybe some abusers just use multiple tools or ways to abuse their victims. That's not entirely clear which is the answer, and maybe pieces of each, but it is super important to think about the many ways somebody can <coughs> use further because it helps us identify what would be those warning signs. <coughs> For instance, just met a victim through a nonprofit that I work with who is um, starting a campaign to end what she calls revenge porn. <clears throat> this is kind of getting some media attention now as well because of the leaks of celebrity photos that we probably, again, can't have missed. But this woman was in a relationship. She felt like he was emotionally and verbally abusive, so he used a couple different tactics with her. Um, so she eventually broke it off. But during the course of their relationship, it was a long distance relationship, she had sent him some pictures, provocative pictures of herself, they had done some things that they videotaped, it consensually, and after they broke up, because he was an abusive person, he decided he would use those as another tool to control her. So in addition to the emotional and verbal and other things he had done, now that she broke up with him, he released those pictures anywhere and everywhere that he could, um, obviously without her consent. At the time, she was a doctoral student at uh, Florida International University down by me, and her dean saw the pictures, and they almost kicked her out of school. She had a job. Her employer fired her, said, I don't want that pictures. I don't know what you're doing with yourself. Um, another form of abuse, right? It's, it's another form of that power, that control, that is every bit as effective if you're an abuser as is physically assaulting somebody, as is emotionally denigrating them, as is financially controlling them, et cetera. 
And so if we kind of think about these forms of abuse, maybe we can also think of ways that we as individuals can, can identify and intervene, right? So if we see somebody in these kinds of relationships, and you, you, you hear about them saying, well, he took those pictures of me, and you won't let me control them. Or you know, he always says the same things in front of my family. These would be like red flags for us as community to say something's not right in that relationship. And then what we can do is not necessarily save somebody out of an abusive relationship. Because that's going to be ultimately their choice to, to leave it, to end it. But what we can do is be those supporters. Too often victims experience what Gladys Ricard experienced, obviously after she passed, but, but what her family experienced was that they're blamed for their own victimization, or they're not believed, or they're told, just leave. And if you don't leave, if you don't break up with that person, there's nothing I can do for you. We're given ultimatums, you know? Moms and dads will say to their teenagers that are in abusive relationships, if you don't break with, up with them, I can't talk to you. you know, what you've just done is cut yourself out as a supporter. Because with, if they're not ready to break up with that person then, then you've just said, well, don't talk to me about anything because I'm not going to deal with you anymore. So what we can all do is not jump in the middle of an abusive relationship and you know, break things up and put ourselves in harm's way. But what we can do when I'm saying like a point for intervention is say something. Be helpful to this person. Give them a point of support. Believe <laughs> them. You know, Let them tell their story if they're ready. Tell them where there's resources in your local community. These are some elements of sort of identifying the problem that can move us along the direction of, again, sort of hopefully preventing the problem. I just wanted to put a couple pictures in here also to highlight again teenagers or victims. This is a college student who was a victim a couple years ago. Um, this one got quite a bit of media attention. Her uh, assailant was eventually convicted. Oftentimes they're not. Um, when you talk about sexual violence in particular, Three of every 100 rapists spends a day in jail in the United States. Any day in jail. So 3%. So oftentimes there isn't justice in the justice system around some of these issues, which again I think suggests to us this is a community issue that we can intervene as a community. And I put this slide in to highlight the fact that children are also exposed to violence in the home at tremendous rates. And it does increase the risk, as you see here in the smaller print, dramatically for them later being involved in abusive relationships. So another thing that I think calls on the community is to say, when we see kids who are in abusive homes, like the spirit family that I showed you earlier, you know, how do we help them break that cycle? How do we help somebody get out of that situation with their kids so their kids aren't exposed to something that's gonna up the risk that they themselves will later be either an abuser or a victim? So I wanna talk some about this response idea. I'm just noticing you're like searching. Oh, uh, this this idea of what would we do as a coordinated community response. And this is language used a lot in the field of domestic and sexual violence because there is recognition in the last 10 to 20 years that it can't just be a law enforcement issue. It can't just be a domestic violence shelter issue. It's going to take all sorts of players in a community to truly give services to those who need it and then to prevent the problem. It's going to take intervention by educators. It's going to take intervention by the medical professionals. It's going to take efforts by social workers and others in many diverse fields and simply by neighbors helping neighbors. So this is the idea of a coordinated community response. I put a couple of these up here because these are some of the campaigns. Um, no More It's a big one, as you see, and domestic violence and sexual assault. It relies a lot on, on social media to make PSAs and to raise awareness. So folks will, will start to learn the signs of unhealthy relationships and be able to intervene. Probably some of you guys saw about Emma Watson's speech before the United Nations. She was fantastic in doing what I hope I'm doing, and that is inviting everyone, male, female, everyone, to be part of the solution. She did that very wonderfully. One Billion Rising is the initiative by Eve Ensler. Some people may know of her work. You may be familiar with Vagina Monologues, which is her work that got a lot, has gotten a lot of attention. But she issued this campaign, and it's on Valentine's Day every year, to have one billion people rising and usually dancing or doing something joyous to, in recognition that one billion women are what the statistics match up with that are victims of domestic and other forms of gender-based violence. And do something, if you're not familiar with it, it's a great resource for high school and college students. Do something actually even gives um, little seed grants. So if you have a project around this or some other issue, you can apply for five hundred dollars and you can make a difference on whatever your issue may be in your community. Check out do something.org. But these are parts of like community responses. What I'd like to tell you next about though is, is the one that I'm most involved with and why I wear the gown. 
And this is what we call the, the College Brides Walk. The Brides Walk emerged out of the case of Gladys Ricard. And it started when a friend of mine, who was in, in South Florida like I do, Josie Ashton, heard about the case of Gladys Ricard. Didn't know her at all. Gladys in New Jersey, Josie in Miami. And, but Josie was, as a domestic violence advocate, outraged at the situation, at the media attention, at all of it. And she had this vision. At the time she was a college student, she was a non-traditional student, she was a little older, she had kids at the time, a husband, and her idea was, I should walk in my gown in honor of, of Gladys, and I should hold signs, and I should have people ask me, why am I dressed in this? Or have people even say, congratulations, it's your wedding day, which they do a lot, and then you have a vehicle to tell them, actually, no, that's, that's, that's not congratulations, this is why I'm dressed like this. And let me tell you about the case of Gladys Ricard. And her vision was, if we do this publicly, we take that spectacle that the media created out of the case, and we put it right back at them. Like, well, we'll be your spectacle, but we're going to be your spectacle to talk about the issue for real and to correct those misconceptions. So Josie originally walked from New Jersey, where the murder happened, all the way down to Miami. She took three months, and she got internship credit as a student, but she had to quit her job. So, <laughs> big every day. And her husband agreed to stay with the kids, and she stayed in women's shelters along the way. Walked most of it, you know, a couple of years, but and we're talking like about thousands of miles over three months. And she used this vehicle to raise awareness of abuse. The idea was caught on, and so now New York every year has a bride's walk in honor of Gladys, and it's a sea of people in bridal gowns and formal gear. They just had their walk last weekend because the anniversary is September 26th. And there are some several other annual bride's walks. Milwaukee has an annual one. Gladys was a Dominican immigrant, and a couple years ago, the Dominican Republic started a walk in honor of Gladys. And so the idea kind of caught on as a way to gain attention to be that vehicle to talk about what is still often a really touchy, difficult issue to talk about. So I met Josie six years ago now, and we were both talking about domestic violence at a local campus, and we were like, oh, we have to do this, but we have to bring it to our college students. Because what we found, and, and maybe it's true here, I don't know, that there are a lot of 5K walks for domestic violence, there are events, but those are often fundraisers, and they often don't very well include college students. Many of our students don't have transportation to get out to the local events, they don't have 20 bucks to participate or whatever it costs, and they just, they, they aren't gonna go. So our idea was let's bring this movement to them, okay? But we didn't want it just to be one campus. We wanted to make it more of a coordinated community response and not just involve a walk, but other elements. So we have now coupled with seven other campuses, mine, Barry University, and seven others in the South Florida area, all within a 90 minute radius, because thankfully we have a lot of universities near us. And we also coupled with the <laughs> local school systems and community groups, groups like we're here, domestic violence service providers, um, <clears throat> police are involved, uh, therapists are involved, we've got educators involved, and so we're trying to pull in all those sort of stakeholders that might have a role in both identifying abuse, serving victims, but then also preventing them. It is a walk, as you see here, and it is free. Josie avowed to the Ricard family when they gave her blessing to do this walk originally that she would never make money off their daughter. She's like, I don't want to raise funds, that's important. These agencies need funds, but that's not what I want to do with this. What I want to do is raise awareness, and so we make it free. And somehow we cobble together funds to make it free, which I can talk about later. <clears throat> and like was, I said, we want to make it more than a walk. A walk can be impactful. It can. When you have a sea of people in bridal gowns, formal gear, and other crazy stuff, walking the streets with signs and chanting, it surely can be impactful. But that's just one element, one day, one moment in time. So what we've started to do is build this out to be a bigger day and a bigger year-long movement. So at the College Brides Walk, we start with an opening ceremony. We feature workshops for all the people to go to so they can learn more like kind of what we're doing today. And on very, very specific issues. So we have a workshop on like technology and abuse, a workshop on abuse in LGBT relationships. Um, we have one on animal abuse and domestic violence. So there's these various facets that people can learn about. We try to incorporate multimedia and arts and performances, and I'm going to show you more of that in a minute, so that we reach people who learn in all different ways and are impacted in different ways. Um, we use some, what I guess we call passive programming, through some signage that I'm going to show you, and we do some ongoing things um, in before the event as well as after the event, so that it again has become sort of more than a walk, but a year-long campaign. So I'm going to show you some pictures from each thing and, and share some of the high points, and then I'm going to stop talking and let you ask questions if you have them.
these are some images from our walk. It's a collection. I probably put too many on my slide. I apologize. But um, just to highlight, up in the corner, you see a couple, a cute couple. And we get a lot of couples who do this together, which I think is a phenomenal statement. Um, we do it every year, right before Valentine's Day, with the idea that A, February is Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month, and B, Valentine's Day is the day people are talking about love. Let's talk about love in every relationship. So it's kind of strategic timing. This couple was dating, and on the walk last year, which actually happened to be on Valentine's Day, they came and showed their commitment to each other by walking together, which is really cool. You see they're both holding like yard signs, too. These are signs that we've created over the course of the last three years. And on the front, it features a picture. You can't see it clearly, but you can see there's an image there with a one to two sentence description. These are all people who lost their lives to domestic violence. Some of them are children, some of them are men, some of them are women, some of them are pregnant women, all ages, and they're very, very powerful. So students walk with these, but they also do put them all over the campus so that even people who aren't in the event see them and they can learn a little bit through seeing them. And on the back side, it talks about, you know, here's some size of views, numbers to call, et cetera. Um, you can see in the banner picture, the logo, the big purple ribbon logo, behind that you couldn't tell, but that is the police chief from the area and the mayor. So we try to get some of the like, high profile leaders involved. Um, you see the mannequin, that's at our midway stopping point, which is one of our university partners. And one of the art students there did this imagery that was disturbing, but also tasteful and not you know, just over the top. And then we had, you know, had a little water break and whatever there. You also see down at the bottom, there's all a bunch of women walking in bridal gowns, but you also see a whole bunch of guys in the other picture. And that's one thing we're working still very actively on, is recruiting men to be part of this visible sea. This was a fraternity group, and they actually went and bought all these roses themselves. And as we walked down the streets, some of the busiest streets in Miami, um, they delivered roses to as many people as they could. They walked up to houses and the cars at stop signs, and like, hey, happy Valentine's Day, let's all have healthy love. Awesome, that's totally their idea, it's very cute. Um, the idea of our walk is too, not to keep it on the campus. Because it, as many of us know, campuses are a little bit contained, you know, not a lot of outsiders go to them. So if you walk around the perimeter of your campus, you may reach your students, but you're not reaching other people. So we walk, like I said, from my university to another one in some of these busiest streets. We get permitting, which is free, because we have We've got some nonprofits that help us out with that. And we get the police to us for us, so it's a safe walk. So we close down these busy streets. That has been met with a teeny bit of yuckiness by a couple cars, but mostly by really good people honking and saying, that's awesome, cool, why are you guys walking? Tell us more. This is a few images from the speakers. Um, that's me in the bottom with an award we got from the mayor for proclaiming it Nash, or proclaiming that. North Miami's um, College Brides Walk Day, and with Josie, who's the lady in the black veil, that's the uh, founder of the idea. Up in the top, that's her with a Latin artist named Alain. He's a Latin Grammy winner, and we somehow managed to get him to perform at last year's walk. And so he did this beautiful song he has about a domestic, growing up in domestic violence, and there was not a dry eye in the crowd, myself included. I was like in there with my university president, and I was blubbering like a baby. But it was amazing. Like, it, the people who aren't as impacted by the verbal could be impacted by the, the emotion of the song. And then I just put the picture of the sea of people because we packed, packed the house. Um, this movement has grown in its first year, which is four years ago. We had about 300 attendees. We were related with that because we were just getting started. Last year we had 1,000. The night before I was having a panic attack because I had to feed everybody lunch and I didn't know what that was going to look like, but it went amazing. This year we already started planning for 2015 and we're pretty sure we're going to have at least 1,500 which might mean we have to move to a new university because mine might not have the capacity anymore. A good problem to have. Um, this picture shows some of the way we've integrated some arts. You see another one of the signs up by the, the tree. We hang up a bunch of the bridal gowns we've had donated. Some people can borrow if they would like to walk in one and they don't have something. They're not required to walk in it, of course. Um, and then you also see a lot of the t-shirts. So maybe folks are familiar with the Clothesline Project. It's an initiative that was started in Cape Cod by survivors of domestic violence. And it's sort of a therapeutic measure. They painted these t-shirts to depict their stories, to give each other hope, and, and they hung them publicly with the idea that a clothesline is both a powerful public visual, but it's also sometimes the place where, back in the days, one of the few places women might gather without men around. And so it's kind of a powerful imagery. It's called the Clothesline Project. 
We've been doing this for years. I literally have hundreds of painted t-shirts in my garage, much to my husband's chagrin, and uh, so do the other organizers. And we hang them all over because it's, again, one more piece of that display so people can stop and look at the shirts and say, oh, wow, that one's really moving, or that one, wow, I never thought of that. This year, last year also, the dancers, we collaborated with our fine arts department, so they did a recital. Turns out they were gonna be doing a February recital anyway, which was beautiful, and it was gonna be themed on love. They're like, oh yeah, we gotta work this out. And so they did this great dramatic interpretive dance um, recital, about 30 minutes long at the end of our walk, all focused on bad and good love. It's a fantastic way to integrate the arts. We go to the local schools and youth groups before and after the walk, so all throughout the year, and we present to them, again, much like I'm doing today, tailored specifically to what a school may need or want, and sometimes we do the teacher painting with them, so that's me having done it with a group of, of young ladies, and we've now, in the last two years, reached over 2,000 high school kids, all done just by training some college students who are like, I care about this, show me how I can do this presentation, we go and do it for free, Anyone who wants it, we'll we figure out how to make that happen. We also try to do little kickoff or announcement events at every campus, because like I said, there's eight of us now, and we want all the student bodies at campuses to, to know about it. Mine knows now. We've been doing it at Barry for four years, and everyone at Barry knows about this event. But at the other campuses, they don't. So we try to think of creative ways to like announce it and get students excited. So one year, a couple years actually, we did like a Zumba kickoff. Zumba's huge down in South Florida. I don't know if it's huge. It was huge. Huge. So this is me. Sorry, put all these pictures of me. But people take them, and that's what I have. Um, me dancing Zumba in my bridal gown. And uh, this is one we're doing actually this year. A piece of cake. We're we're gonna have bridal cake, wedding cake, and we're gonna do an educational presentation to kick off the walk and give everyone cake who comes. And the idea is, is it a piece of cake to end abuse? No. But is it possible? Yes. So just again, kind of creative thinking about how do we let people know. So I put this slide in just to kind of think about where we're at with our movement. This is one thing. I'm not suggesting you would need or want to do this here, but if you would like to, that would be cool too. And if I could help with that, then I would. Um, but maybe it gives ideas of other things that you either already are doing and want to do more of, or maybe things you haven't thought of. Um, what I see as the strength of our, our initiative as a com com coordinated community response is the multiple and varied partners we have. The idea that every year it looks a little bit different. There's always the walk component, and there's always arts components, and there's always speaker components, but what exactly that looks like is different every year, which I think is cool, because it keeps it fresh, but with still an identity. Um, our goal is to also address the, the social norms that underlie abuse, so through the workshops and the speakers, we talk about some of these cultures in which abuse is more common. We talk about the correlations between, like I said, pet abuse and technology and these things. And we also invite all of the organizations to table there, much like the literature you hear, so that people who are participating, if they need help right there, they know where to go. And students who are engaged can say, wow, I want to volunteer. Like, I want to do that. I want to go with that organization. We've also created petitions every year about local, local, state, and national legislation that's being considered that we think is relevant to the issue. For instance, when your uh, Violence Against Women Act was being reauthorized or being voted to be reauthorized, and so we had some petitions from participants saying, please, Congress, vote to reauthorize VAWA. Um, we were just celebrating the 20th anniversary of VAWA. It's been a huge piece of legislation for victims of domestic violence. So we try to bring in some like these activist and real immediate advocacy components. We also, like I said, have grown every year. So I feel that's a huge strength when you're trying to grow one thing. Things we need more assistance with, well, yeah, that's money. Um, I ended up somehow cobbling together some funds from various groups I'm part of. My university kicks in just a little bit here and there. The other organizers shake down their university wherever way we can. But as it's grown, it, we're at the point where it needs to be more sustainable funding, and so we're working on that. We know we have a lot of males and boys, males and boys, men and boys, who are interested in helping, who have helped, but we want even more. So we're working actively on, okay, so what are the strategic ways to get guys and say, we want you with us? Um, more and more education, as many school groups as we can reach is what we want to do. And then now we're also at the point of we want to evaluate. Like we feel like we're successful because it's grown, it's got attention, we get a lot of media attention. Last year CNN even picked it up. Um, you know, it gets good coverage, but that doesn't mean effectiveness. So we've got to start to work in now, you know, how do we evaluate, is this changing people's sets of norms, is this changing victimization?
conversation, and we, we've now done that a lot. So I ended, because Gail says it's time for question and answer, and I agree. Gandhi, this is his birthday today, and so Gandhi, as a peacemaker, one of the quotes that I don't hear as much from him, but I like, the future depends on what we do in the present. So like, let's take hopefully some, some nugget or something you learned today, and maybe we can do something with that. And then I really liked this one from Janelle Monáe as well. So I'll just leave that up there, and as I said, as I promised, I will stop talking. So questions, comments, thoughts, ideas, maybe you have ideas that we can include this year, that'd be awesome. Yes, sir. Um, I was just wondering about the relationship between like mental illness and like either being a victim or like kind of, you know uh, or an actual uh, contributor to. Great, I'll repeat the question too until Dale you know, gets around with the Oprah mic. Um, but uh, so the question was the role of mental illness, either in perpetration or in victimization. It's not totally clear is the answer, um, but it does. <laughs> It does seem to be a minimal part. Um, from what we know about known batterers, most do not have an identifiable mental illness, and most victims don't have an identifiable mental illness. Now, some people struggle after victimization with a variety of sort of mental health outcomes, but it's not clear that they necessarily had those before the abuse, or it's, it's subsequent. Um, it's a really important question, and I think you, I'm sure you asked it out of a really good place, but just to take that a step farther, what people sometimes do is say, man, for someone to hit their wife or do these crazy things, they must be crazy, they must be sick. And we do have to be cautious of that because I think when, we, when, when victims believe that, they can very much eat, chalk it up to abuse, their, their abuse up to mental illness and think, well, if they just get help, they'll stop abusing me. But if they don't get help for the actual issue, if the issues are correlated but not the same, then it doesn't address. So that's a really good question, but it doesn't seem to be a really strong linkage from what research says. So there are other factors. Other questions, comments, again, ideas? I have them? this microphone. <laughs> Certainly while not as uh, physically debilitating, uh, emotional abuse can be very, very tragic. Uh, I've encountered some of them with, the, with people that I've worked with. Could you elaborate a little bit more on how emotional abuse could be perpetrated upon another? Absolutely, and, and you're so right. And working with some victims, um, they often say that's worse. You know, that the physical wounds heal, but the emotional stays with you in this baggage for a long, long time, if not forever. And so many times they'll say, yeah, I, I, I don't prefer it if my abuser would physically abuse me than this. Obviously our goal is that none of that happens. Um, but yet there's a lot of tactics that an abuser can use to emotionally wear you down. And what's interesting about abusers is they, you know, it's all kind of about this power and control piece, right? They're very controlling, manipulative people. So with each individual that they're abusing, the tactics may be different, right? So like for me, what might be my hot button emotional issues would be totally different than, than someone else. And so an abuser plays into that. They find sort of those vulnerabilities or weaknesses, and that's how they find a way to sort of emotionally or again verbally abuse you. Um, a lot of times we hear about um, people who, who don't even get physically assaulted, but it's more of an intimidation emotional, like, I have a gun, and it's right here. I don't even have to touch it because I've already emotionally messed with you because you see my weapon, right? And you know that I can use it against you. That's fairly common. Um, just threats, even, as an emotional tool. I will hurt you. If you break up with me, I will hurt your family. Um, denigrating people's religious beliefs is very common as a tool sort of control. Um, this wasn't necessarily related to your question, but one I think is worthy of mention. Um, immigration status in South Florida in particular is very huge. We have a lot of immigrants, and so you know sometimes the perpetrators will be like, I gotta control your papers. And if you leave me, if you tell anyone what's going on, you will be deported, you will never see your kids again. It's just another, again, of those wranglings with your, not only emotions, but finances and other things. Really important to watch for that. Usually, if you have know a little bit about this, you can kind of, and you see a couple together, you can kind of see it, almost. And what I mean by that is in their demeanors, often. Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, the abusers are the ones who take control of the verbal. They, um, they're the ones who are the center, right? And the victims tend to be not weak and submissive, because that's not what I'm suggesting, but in the presence of their abuser, defer to them, aiming almost emotionally shrink. And so sometimes if you start to look for those signs in couples, you know, you can be like, wow, that dynamic is just not quite right. There's nothing, there's nothing parallel about how they present, you know? 
it's, a, it's a partial answer. Right? There's a lot to your question, and it's a really good one. But are there other thoughts? Is there anything that your group does to deal with the perpetrator so he won't go out and continue that right. cycle of violence right. like, uh, the Ray Rice issue? It's obvious that he had issues, but you know, he, he made it to the NFL. Yeah. You know, he's a million. He's a successful guy in a lot of ways. Successful yeah. guy, he's a millionaire. Yeah. But how does your organization yeah. deal with the, the perpetrator? Because right. I, I think that that's the source for me, you know, if you're dealing with the perpetrator. Right. Yeah, and it's a great question. I mean, we don't, uh, uh, right now, have like a batter's intervention program or one of those types of like more formal ways of dealing with abusers, which are out there. Our community has them, so we can do a you know, referral to that. But what our tactic is more about talking to people in a dialogue about how do you, you know, how do you treat people, and if you, uh, I'll give you a for instance. I was presenting about this one time, and it was a group of high school students, boys and girls, and just letting people in the audience know sort of some of these warning signs or whatever, and I had a couple boys come up to me afterwards and they were like, ma'am, what you described, I do that with my girlfriend. And I was like, okay, um, that's, that's not where you want to be, right? Or she wouldn't have said that to me. So like, what, do, what can we do? What can we do to equip you to see a different way to behave with your girlfriend, you know? And so I think through the educational initiatives, the goal is to reach people to say, wait, I'm, I'm going down that road, or, and to activate, to your really important question, activate others to check their peers. Because these, these cultures in which abuse and sexual assault are more common feed on bystanders, right? They a, get, lot, a lot of it is probably psychological, right? Maybe, maybe, or, or maybe because they're getting egged on by folks around them with no repercussion for so, so long that they build up the, this mentality that this is what I do and it's okay because no one's expecting on it. And so building up sort of that bystander intervention thing where every one of us can say something to our peer, our friend, our whatever, who may be not treating their girlfriend or boyfriend like we might to. And if people check other people, sometimes that's the most amazing and effective route. Better even, I think, than sometimes in criminal justice and other things. You know, a bunch of guys saying, dude, what you were doing is not okay or a bunch of girls saying to your friend, man, you are mean to him, you are emotionally disparaging him and it's not okay, sometimes that can be very effective, but it very infrequently happens until we reach audiences and they say, I can do that, you know, I can say that. Other questions, thoughts? Yeah, I know we just covered uh, male on female violence and female on male, but has there ever been any reported cases of, you know, male on male domestic violence yes. or female on female? Yes. Is it like, yeah. are the numbers lower or just as common? That's a great question. It's about equal, about similar statistics as in heterosexual relationships. Dynamics are a little different, right? Like, so some of the tools that a user may use in a gay relationship might be a little different. For instance, what if the person that they're dating that they're abusing isn't out to their family yet, which sometimes happens. They're kind of keeping the relationship you know, on, uh, on the down low for now. An abuser may use that outing as a tool of control. But the statistics say it's, a, it's about as common. Um, and so really, again, focusing on this isn't just a sort of heterosexual phenomenon. This isn't a dumb person phenomenon. It's not one race or ethnic group or religion or any of these things. But it's just that anyone who's in a relationship has the risk of being a bad one. And let's hope, you know, again, we can minimize that risk. I'll repeat your question so you don't have to run over. Sorry, today, I think I'm a little more um, specific, but there is a very large healthcare crowd here. Um, now, I know that we are, that, you know, we certainly can be at the, at the front line sometimes, and we're in a very confidential setting. Sometimes, if, if you're taking a history in, in physical, a person kind of says something, and you're like, oh, you know, maybe that, maybe I'm suspecting something, maybe there is, there is, abuse going on, but, but the patient isn't willing to either outright say it, but you sense it, and you don't have kind of a, a support group around you or, or around them to, to suggest it. Mm -hmm. Have you encountered any tips or tricks to kind of address that situation? Like, if we are the frontline person, strictly being a single person, how would we go about that? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and I'm glad you brought it back to the folks that were in the crowd. So, yeah. Um, you know, some states have mandatory reporting for physicians. So if you identify signs of abuse or if a victim discloses to you, you're required to call authorities. Some states do not. My state does not have that. If you're in a place that does not have mandatory reporting, 
because if you are, then you might have some, you know, you have some legal obligations of what you do. But if you aren't required to report, then the best advice is to ask the victim what they would like you to do. Okay, so like, I'm saying, you know, it might go something like this. You answered some of my questions to suggest that something is not going well in your home, or I'm seeing signs that are consistent with abuse, I'm worried about you, would you like me to call authorities? Would you like me to contact a local shelter? Would you like, and if the victim says no, then it is important to honor their wishes because you're not under a legal obligation to do other, again, providing you're in a state. And sometimes it's very disempowering for a victim to jump the gun and say, I'm gonna like kind of push you to make a decision, right? So, so the asking piece is very important. If you're a solo person, like a solo practitioner, or you don't have that, that resources around, it would be really good to connect with a local provider so that you have at least referral information there saying, you know, like, I've identified these things and I, I'm not I'm not personally equipped to like serve you in this way, but like, here, please take, you know, that's the best protocol you probably could do if you don't have on staff social workers and people you can go to. Um, believing victims is really important though. I've encountered a lot of great professionals in the healthcare fields who do, and a few who are a little resistant to believe some of these myths and so I think if, if anything is important, it's just like listening to their story if they're willing to say it and accepting that that's their story. And um, it's not our job to judge it. It's not our, you know. And I, again, I think that can go a long way to allowing them to further disclose to you if they're ready to, et cetera. Um, they even say things as simple as like hanging literature in your bathrooms, like the little tabs, you know, of call this number. Actually, studies have found it to be very helpful to victims because it does a couple things. It tells the victims and non-victims even, my physician knows and cares about this issue because they wouldn't have put the sign up, and it does it in a discreet way they can go later call for help. So, you know, a couple simple things that can happen um, that don't put the onus on the physician or the, the healthcare provider, but it puts you in place to do that referral or, you know, resource guiding. That's an awesome question. We have time for more, for me anyway. Um, yeah. Could you talk a little more about my standard use by standard training yes. as part of your? Um, yes. And that, in fact, that's really kind of our focus, even though we don't always call it officially that. It's really how we present all the workshops we do, everything we go to the schools, is really about sort of how do we activate each other to step up and intervene. Um, if we had many more hours together, which I doubt you wanted, but I would have been happy to have. Um, there's a great, some great video clips, and one I was going to show you from Jackson Katz who has a program called Mentors in Violence Prevention. It's a bystander intervention program, and it is directed largely, not exclusively, but largely at athletes, fraternities, these sort of male-dominated groups, about how do you step up? How do you be that, that positive, active bystander? Because you can be a negative, active bystander, right? You can see an incident and be the hooting and hollering, you know, like the high school fight where like, the circle forms around it. That, you can be those people. Or you could be that person who walks up and taps them on the shoulder and be like, that's not okay, or I'm calling the police. Interestingly, there's research out of bullying, actually, that if you interrupt an incident of bullying in any way, within 10 seconds, you can shut that incident down. And by any way, I mean yelling gibberish, freaking out, um, <laughs> tapping them, scream, whatever. Like something that disrupts it, that interrupts what the bully's doing. And I've seen some of that interesting research kind of apply to these issues too. If you happen to be visibly seeing somebody abusing their partner, right, and that might not be physical or might be these other ways, disrupting it can at least in the short term pass down or to shut it down. Those I think are important things to teach bystanders. It's some of the stuff that we talk about. Like you don't have to put yourself in harm's way. You don't have to like put your hands between the couple and you know stop break up the fight. But you can freak out and yell gibberish, and maybe it helps. You know. Um, so yeah, we do a lot of that, but there are a lot of great tools on bystander intervention. Um, again, Jackson Katz has some really good stuff. Uh, there's Futures Without Violence is another great organization that has a ton of stuff. They have a program called Coaching Men into Boys that's targeted towards men. There's some other bystander intervention stuff that's by called Break the Cycle that focuses on men and boys and girls. It's obviously don't leave girls on the equation. Um, so there's a lot of resources, and we just kind of pull from a lot of them to craft what works in our area. I think that's actually really important too. What one group or one region does isn't the right thing necessarily for everyone else. You know, their ideas, maybe I've given you some, maybe I've not, but just imposing someone's program 
doesn't necessarily mean it's going to take well in your community. So knowing your community, knowing who your partners and who the stakeholders should be, if you want to create some kind of movement similar or whatever way, what we, we do, you know, figure out what will work here is really important. So, okay, I'll stop talking. There's more to that answer too, but <laughs> anything else? Other questions? If there are some for me more individually, I'm <coughs> thankful my parents were able to come in from Jackson and drive me home and hang with them tonight. Yes. Give them a little bad, but I don't think we have to bust it out of here, so we might have a few minutes if folks wanted to ask individual questions if you didn't want to ask in front of the or something. Well,